Tēnā koutou katoa, ko mākiru toku ingoa, he māngai a hau o tēnei kaupapa, he kaupapa hauora, he kaupapa ura hoki, he nāro rangatira mā tēnei te mihi mai oha ki a koutou. Kia ora everyone, my name is Mark Little and I have the absolute privilege to be the chair of the Healthcare Home Collaborative. Now I'm just going to hand over to Lance who will open the session proper with the karakia. Lance. Oh, kia ora Mark. <coughs> Uh, tutama wai, tutama wai mai runga, tutama wai mai raro, tutama wai e roto, tutawa mai e waho. Kia taua ai, te mauri tu, te mauri ora, kia katawa, haumi e, hui e, taeki. Kia ora, Lance, thank you. So, hey, look, thanks for joining and welcome. Um, Our focus today is going to be on sharing and learning about the healthcare home model. Uh, we're very lucky to have the Why Healthcare Home session, and I'd like, first of all, to introduce all of our panellists. Dr. Andrew Miller, who's a GP at Bush Road Medical Centre and the clinical lead for the Healthcare Home Collaborative. Dr. Nick Chamberlain, Chief Executive Officer of Northland DHB and the National DHB CEO lead for primary care. And Lance Norman, who's the Head of Equity and Māori Health Outcomes at ProCare Health. Our focus today is on sharing learnings about the healthcare home model of care and how it has transformed many New Zealand general practices. Many of the recent transformations made by general practices during COVID-19 will benefit patients for years to come. And this discussion will focus on how we can retain these transformations, as well as ensuring that equity remains front and center for Fano. Andrew will provide an overview of the benefits of the healthcare home model and share some of the evidence of the positive outcomes for those who are on the journey. Lance will share our focus on how we are strengthening equity within the healthcare home model of care, as well as ensuring that we are honouring te tiriti o waitangi. Nick will focus on how we lock in and retain changes in virtual care that has occurred across all of general practice, as well as highlighting the complexity of the work and actions across our networks. There will be an opportunity for Q&A via the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll point you to resources that may be helpful during this time of crisis. You will also see stuff on the collaborative website and the collaborative website details on the screen. Now, before I hand over to Andrew, I just wanted to say very quickly that for Pegasus Health in Canterbury, the recent experiences have been amazing. Uh, the feedback we've had from our teams and our networks and practices has been uh, overwhelmingly in support of the work the collaborative has done. And without the tools and resources and sharing of the collaborative, I think we all would have struggled. So a big thank you and I am acknowledging my bias there. The other thing I would like to say is that we are beginning to collect and collate emerging data sources around how practices are coping and how those practices who are well advanced on the healthcare home journey seem to be doing much better and faring much better than those who are not. So whilst it's not definitive or evidence, certainly the indications are that if you can work differently and you know how to work differently and you work proactively, then the experience has been a whole lot better. So now I will just go quiet and I will hand over to Andrew and thank him for his session. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Um, just give me a uh, bear with me a second. I'm just going to get my screen shared and we'll go from there. Mario, guys. Kira uh, um Andrew Morrow. I'm a GP up in Whangarei. I've been a GP for 25 years in uh, my practice. We've got a practice of 11,500 um, patients for an access practice. Um, I Though Mark has said I'm a clinical uh, lead along with Jeff Lowe at the Collaborative, I would probably better be described as a clinical follower. Um, I quite like following good ideas. I like um, uh, doing things that seem to make sense to me in terms of making things better for my patients and better for the um, staff in my practice. Um, at times I've had to put up with crash test dummies and things haven't gone well, but as far as the Healthcare Homes Collaborative, there's nothing we've been doing in our practice that hasn't actually made sense to us and our patients. Um, the other thing is that this has not been about the doctors or the GPs in the practice. This has been a uh, practice-wide uh, exercise. All the staff, including nurses and our admin staff, have come up with incredible ideas. And also we're engaging our patients to find out whether what we're doing seems to make sense to them. So of all the things I think I've ever done in the last 25 years of general practice, the last three years of rolling up healthcare homes has been probably the most exciting and enjoyable thing um, I've done. And 
I'm yet to talk to one of our practices around the country that's doing this, that say they'd want to go and uh, go back to where they were. Um, I'm also very um, clear that when I go to work in the morning, I'm responsible for what goes on in that building. I own my practice and um, I have a responsibility to make sure things go well for my patients and my staff. And so I'm not going to blame PHAs or DHBs or ministries. If something's available to me that actually could make a difference and could improve equity and could improve outcomes and could improve my lot and patients' lots, and uh, I need to be doing that. And saying that too, I think general practice is chronically under-resourced for change implementation. And the collaborative has been a breath of fresh air and that it's been one place where you can go and get some help outside of all your existing um, organisations and you'll meet enthusiastic people that are willing to help and certainly some of you would have noticed in the last month that there's a whole lot of stuff coming your way from the collaborative um, because we've got a really good culture now of being able to implement and change things in a way that makes sense. So I've been so impressed with the clinical leads and the guys down in uh, collaborative over the last month on how much effort and time they put in even um, organising things like these some uh, set webinars. So big um, shout out to all my leads who have just been absolutely awesome. So probably more um, right, he said, why healthcare homes? I'd probably say, why not healthcare homes? Um, I leave it up to you guys. I'm not, one thing I'm not gonna do is try and sell you something. We're not a franchise. We're not particularly interested in whether you do or don't wanna do it. If you do it, you wanna do it, we'll help you. If you don't wanna do it, we're not gonna listen to arguments about um, why you think it's a bad idea because to a degree we haven't got the energy to try and change the minds of people who um, uh, uh, resistant to change. And I guess that comes down to Darwin. I mean, I guess we're saying, you look at that there, that's, uh, you know, it's not the most intelligent um, that survive it, so they're responsive to change. And certainly the last month of showing we all can all change. I think there wouldn't be anyone now in New Zealand that um, in general practice that hasn't realised that we can change and it's actually quite doable. So coming out the other side of COVID, I think there'll be many of us who go, actually that wasn't as bad as I thought it would. But, um, Sam I am, I think the green eggs and ham aren't going to be as nasty tasting as we thought um, and I hope that what we have embedded in the last month with change actually stays because it's been um, good I think. So we often talk too about triple aim, that's one, two and three and you know, I often talk about patient experience and I have mentioned already I think that one of the great things that's come out of the healthcare homes work in my practice is it's been better for my care, the well-being of my care team guys I work with. Our practice was absolutely swamped with uh, urgent and unplanned care. It was a train wreck, literally, and we went coping. And although we're still really busy, in the last three years, it's organised busy, it's manageable busy, it's actually an okay busy. And I think the atmosphere of my practice, the environment has improved no end. Uh, we've even lost two full-time equivalents over um, the last little while, and we've just coped um, because we've got things working much more efficiently and we're working as a team. And it seems to be working around the country. Um, you know, we've now got 1.3 million New Zealanders across New Zealand are inside a healthcare homes practice. Um, and that number would grow really rapidly probably in the next year because many of the organisations inside the collaborative are only just starting. So many have an, are very early on in terms of enrolling uh, practices. So um, this is not again driven by the ministry or by your DHBs or by your PHOs. It's actually driven by generally clinical leaders and people that think this looks like a good idea. And there's a whole swag of them, as you can see there. Um, and they're all coming from different angles. So they've got different funding, no funding, um, different drivers, but they're all working together because um, we're all smarter together than we are on our own. Um, and we can't make all this collateral in terms of change readiness without actually um, working together. Many of us have been on it at longer than the others go to meetings and learn things from some of the newcomers who've come on with brand new ideas and we just walk away every time going, well, that's a great idea, I'll have a crack at that. Um, from a patient's point of view, this model of care is really about, I guess, with urgent and unplanned things, keeping people, um, giving them access when they're feeling unwell. It's about preventative care to make people with long-term conditions stay well. It's about routine and routine care for people who are wanting to stay healthy and also um, business efficiency. So when people come to our practices, the places are running well and they feel like they're having a, um, a nice experience inside our rooms. So that's the patient view. There's a beautiful little um, video clip of that um, done by the collaborative and I won't show you it, but if you went onto YouTube and just looked up New, New Zealand Healthcare Homes Model of Care, you'll actually see that little clip there. Just walked you through it. 
the collaborative's got an incredible amount of resource on it, the collaborative website. So much of what we're talking about, if you just want to go and browse and spend some time, those resources are all sitting there. Um, and so, you know, from a patient point of view, um, our ability to do with un unplanned or urgent care, you know, the ability to get to your appointment on the same day if it's necessary, is so much easier inside the health games practice. Uh, we're really trying to work on getting care plans for all those that need it. We're within our practices trying to have a um, better coordinated uh, team of people we work with. Um, we're trying to triage people so they actually see the right person for the right length of time um, at the right time. Uh, we're offering alternatives to face-to-face -face consultations. I think that uh, much of the country before healthcare homes is driven by just 15 minute face-to-face -face appointments, trying to do things by triage calls, by telephone consults, by um, management health messaging or uh, video consultations. Certainly the last month has shown that's doable. It's doable not just inside healthcare homes practices, but everywhere we've been uh, driven down that track very rapidly. Uh, the improved telephone access is not so much about the triage, but actually more about making sure your phone systems work. And some of the stuff we found out when we uh, started in our own practices, there was a whole lot of drop calls, people waiting a long time. And we've done a long, lot to make that experience better for patients, which is actually better for business. All of our health games practices are hell-bent on raising portal numbers. Uh, portals are fantastic for patients. They're also really good for um, practitioners within the practice. It's a different way of doing your work, but um, it's um, beneficial both ends. Uh, we're also trying to improve how we communicate information to patients. Not great, a great fan, I don't write that side of the word health literacy. I think our job as um, providers is to make things uh, clearer. It's about health parity. And for practices, um, as I said, we're better able to make, manage our daily workload through triaging. Uh, the train wreck has stopped in my own practice. We got the train back on the tracks. Um, we're certainly actually more efficient then by reducing uh, acute same-day demand. We're actually making sure that clinicians can spend their time uh, doing things that actually um, are more useful than seeing people that don't need to be seen. Certainly from a patient experience point of view, if you don't need to come to the practice, you can be sorted out in a couple of minutes on a triage call. That's good all around. Uh, my own practice has definitely increased the size of our team. We've now got uh, three medical care assistants. We've got a health case, a health improvement practitioner, um, and we're um, working much more collaboratively with our pharmacists. Um, so we're also then spring up some time to do more proactive plan um, care, which has been very useful. Um, we've got um, coordination, I guess, within the, in the team itself, but also we're trying to actually coordinate things um, outside of the practice with our other um, providers in our network. Um, sorry, oops, there you go. Um, and interestingly, and not surprisingly, some of my colleagues who are um, very unkeen on launching into this when we first described it are actually happier in their jobs. They're actually looking forward to the next few years of general practice and have felt that this has been one of the things that's made a big difference to their quality of practice, which is really great. This is a slightly cheeky, I think that we've seen a lot recently about um, um, the expression virtual consultations. And I take slight objection to the, um, the, the use of that. We've got alternative ways of doing things. They're real ways of doing things. They're not virtual. Virtual often implies a sense that they're not quite as good. Um, I think what we found in the last month that some of the things we're doing, which are other access points, are just as valid, just as real, and just as good for patients as, as they used to be. We'd already embedded many of these things in our um, healthcare homes. So, uh, you know, triaging patients, telephone consults, video consults, um, messaging, uh, consults were all in amongst it anyway. Uh, the last month's shown that those can be ramped up considerably and um, hopefully will carry on in places that weren't doing it, um, you know, seeing that's quite manageable to do it. Um, we've certainly noticed that um, it reduces volume during triage of same day urgent care. Prior to COVID, my practice was um, resolving 40% of all incoming calls for the day over the uh, with um, short. Um, Triage consults, we're doing triage all day now, the GPs, just because of the way it is. Um, and we're now resolving, um, in our last look, 72% of all incoming calls in the last month um, since we got lockdown have been resolved in a triage call. Um, seems that patients have transitioned pretty well to telephone consults. 
Um, interesting enough, the Nirvana always seems to be, we talk about video consults and how we should actually be trying to do more of those, but technically they're more challenging both for patients and providers. And it would be nice to have some very slick technology. I'm using Doxemi, which is absolutely awesome, but um, it's not as straightforward as picking up the phone. Uh, the day will come, I think, when it will be, but um, to a large extent, we've coped very well just with telephone consultations. The other thing you may have noticed in, in practices that got a portal is the traffic on portals has really substantially increased in the last month uh, with COVID. We've gone up 50% um, increase in the number of incoming and outgoing messages. I think the last thing there, which I put in capital letters and probably won't speak to too long, is that um, I think it's slightly exposed the absurdity of our current funding model in general practice that uh, you make money through capitation and face-to-face -face consults. All those alternative ways of doing things are all legitimate, and yet they're not really uh, supported or encouraged or funded in a way that really makes sense. But I haven't got time to go in that. Lama just told me I had 15 minutes, and that would take me an hour to talk to. Um, I just thought very briefly again about triage, which I've mentioned, but it does um, seem to give our patients um, uh, value their time. Don't need to come in, especially in Northall, with bad roads, bad cars, and long distances. Um, a great advantage that you can be sorted out. It does give another way of doing things. It's improved my business efficiency, which again is another conversation, but the fewer people I see, the more efficient my business is. Um, high utilisation leads to uh, lower income for practices. Uh, we've lost our train wreck demand. We're doing things more proactively and our patients enjoy it. Uh, dare I say also, my clinicians really like doing triage. They got used to it and now would never go back. That model I showed you with the, um, the, uh, from the patient view, that one looks really um, quite intense. You think, oh goodness me, inside this model of care, look at all these things I have to do. I really just want to show you this because if you do something as simple as doing telephone triage, you resolve all that area of Asian and unplanned care. So simply setting up triage resolves those elements inside your practice. But not only will it do that, it'll actually do some stuff in all those other domains I'm not going to dwell too long, you know, you know the stuff here you'll be able to look at in your, in your own time. But simple bedrock platform type of changes inside your practice, such as putting in triage across a whole lot of domains, and makes a huge difference to your business efficiency, your workflow, and how well your patients and yourselves feel about your day. Likewise, portals, I'm a great fan of portals. I've um, been at this uh, portal um, uh, story for a while and still a bit embarrassed that only 12% of New Zealand, adult New Zealanders can actually get access to a portal and 1% can read their own notes after us as GPs having seven or eight years of uh, being given a chance to do this. Um, but again, you know, they're to me pretty much a no-brainer. Information that resides in our systems is not ours to own. Um, to a large degree, patients in my view are owners of their own information. Uh, if they need us to help them or someone else to help them, they participate with us. We can participate in their care. The only patients in New Zealand are those that are in an intensive care unit or under an anaesthetic. The moment you're awake, you're participating or owning. And so the fact that we are um, not giving patients access to their information and allowing them to participate with us, I think is pretty indefensible. And again, if you were to put in a portal, which is that little there, fully functional patient portal, voila, what it does for your business, both for your business and for your patients, is that and that. So with those two simple things I showed you, which is triage and portals, the number of benefits to your practice and your patient with two simple interventions is, is, is incredibly large. Um, and I was told I had to actually stick to 15 minutes, so I've probably done less than 15 minutes is good, because I imagine the end of this is lots of questions we're going to have to answer. And I will stop sharing and pass the presentation over to Lance. So thanks, guys. Lance, you're still on mute. Aha. There you go. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks uh, a lot, Andrew. Um, so, yeah, I'm the uh, head of equity for uh, ProCare and also the National Tally Triage Service, but uh, fortunate enough to be the equity lead on healthcare homes. Uh, and today uh, I'm going to just step you through um, what, a, what, what equity means um, to the healthcare homes because it's, it's front and centre of the entire model. 
what, what I personally like is these three components of healthcare homes. The first is how do we get a, uh, a better business model for our um, general practices so that it could free up some more money to potentially get another a 0.5 nurse or a healthcare assistant uh, that could then focus on recalls for uh, our high needs populations. Uh, secondly, I, I like that it focuses on um, getting clinical our clinical staff working to the top of their scope. And the third one, is, is which is integral, is how do we get uh, equity of uh, outcomes across our, our general practice model, which, which is not always there uh, in some of our um, primary care models. So what I like about this uh, is, is the focus on equity. So I'll just move into our presentation um, and then um, feel free to uh, drop some questions uh, into the chat. So, so firstly, what does it mean? It's strengthening equity and co-design for, ma for Māori partnerships and outcomes. So the key component of this, so yes, so the, the key component of the co-design from an equity point of view is Māori uh, and Pacific people have actually been uh, heavily involved in the co-design of the healthcare homes model. So we've, we've created a, a pathway where we've got um, consumers on our group who look at this model of care and say, what does it look like from my point of view rather than from a, a clinical or referral pathway point of view. So, so a, key, a key component is Māori and Pacific and our whānau have been a, a part of developing this, this model of care uh, for us. Um, I, I won't talk to the slides, but they'll, they'll all be available afterwards. But you can actually see, because of this, uh, the new healthcare home model, we have been able to improve um, our outcomes for our, our Māori and Pacific uh, communities. Um, Dr. Andrew talked about patient portals. You know, the ability for our whānau to be able to book their own appointments online at a time that's convenient to them, uh, to be able to log on and check their patient notes. Um, if they're in a hurry and they can't take time off work, to, the ability to have a five or ten minute phone call with a GP either during uh, normal business hours or, or, or from five to six after, after work hours has completely closed in a number of health gaps that we do have in our current primary care system. So, so some, of these, some of these concepts have been developed um, by talking to our communities and talking to our whānau. Uh, but the key, of it, key, key to the model is it puts the whānau at the centre of our, uh, our model uh, and, and wraps the services around, around them rather than uh, dictating what services um, are to be delivered to our, our, our communities. So when we say let's focus on equity, what, what does that mean? Uh, we, we know there's a health and disability review uh, systems review out now. We know there's a treaty claim um, from uh, Y2575 out now. And what, what Healthcare Homes does is it's taking those recommendations and, and actually starts entrenching it into our healthcare model now, rather than waiting for government agencies uh, or government policy to change. So, for example, it encourages working closer with some of your Māori or treaty uh, partners in your communities. Uh, it encourages uh, opening it from just the general practice model to connecting to um, some community services around budgeting, potentially family violence. Uh, food bank is now an important component that we're seeing through COVID. And it, and it widens the scope of work from just the general practice view to a whole of health and wellbeing view. Um, so those recommendations that um, have been talked about, we've actually in, in, in embedding those in, in, the, in the medical model now. So our, our communities are getting much better access to health and social services through the healthcare home model. Um, what's some of the proposed vision? Um, so we've we've made this a, a completely um, unapologetically Māori model of care. So there are existing models that have been developed by uh, Professor Sir Mason Drury. Um, you know, so what we do is it's all around Modi order, uh, whānau order, and wai order. Which, which effectively means healthy individuals, healthy families, and healthy environments. So be, because we're, we're making it wider than just the, the, the core general practice model, it's a, it's a holistic health and well-being model, which ultimately um, we know that in general practice, probably 20% of the good work we're doing um, uh, will improve someone's health and well-being. But if we're not addressing those social determinants, uh, like housing, like poor insulation, uh, like uh, smoking in the house um, and those other de social determinants, if we're not addressing those, we're not really going to be um, able to uh, improve the health outcomes of our whānau as well as we could. So by wrapping around uh, the holistic model of care uh, in, in the primary care setting, um, we'll, we'll, enhance, we'll enhance our whānau's um, ability to improve their health and wellbeing um, much better. Um, whānau order is a, is a concept that's been around for quite a while. Um, it, it just means uh, family wellbeing. 
Uh, and, and once again, um, I'll just touch on it quickly, but it, effectively, it's a um, multidiscipline team working across primary care and social care to, to look after our whānau and refer between social organisations and our primary care organisations. Um, these are some of our proposed values. Um, I won't go through them all. They're, they're quite uh, renowned um, from a Māori point of view, but um, if I go to my next slide here, it actually um, gives gives a bit of a, a, a translation of what those what those those mean. I'm, I'm just going to flick on a couple. So Manaki Tanga, uh, acknowledging the mana of every party in order to create um, an environment of respect for different perspectives and behaviours. Uh, Dr. Andrew talked about how um, it's actually the patient notes. It's that you know so having having the ability for whānau to access their own notes to determine what that means and. and have an understanding on the health of their uh, health and well-being of their whānau because they have a better health literacy is, is quite important. Um, kaitianga akitanga, uh, that means, you know, um, uh, by way of example, is, is we meet and greet people at the front desk in a, in a polite and courtesy and culturally appropriate way. Uh, our, our, our workforce is culturally competent and cultural in a culturally um, appropriate uh, way. And we're providing the workforce with toolkits on, on how, they can, how they can do that to improve themselves in terms of their cultural safety uh, in the clinical environment. And what does it mean for um, healthcare homes? Well, um, so in, in Māori space, we have a, 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 um, a saying called to Māori, by Māori, for Māori. But if you apply those logics across our whole healthcare system, uh, what works for Māori uh, and our other vulnerable populations works for everybody. So some of these things we've, we've, we've entrenched have, have actually had an enhancement model for our whole populations that we're managing through um, primary care. Uh, and the key, the key being building relationships um, is, is, is probably the strongest uh, recommendation I, um, I've seen come through healthcare homes. Uh, from a Māori perspective, um, if we like you and trust you, we're going to want you to work with us um, in a clinical environment. So building those relationships, more, more so um, by way of example now, when everything's moving to virtual consultations, uh, how, how do you build that rapport to do a um, 15 or 20 minute consult virtually if you haven't built, it, built up that, that rapport or that um, relationship um, throughout your um, clinical and patient or whānau journey? Um, so, um, yeah, what, what's next? Um, now, now, virtual consultations uh, pre-COVID was probably less than 5% in New Zealand. Uh, it's currently sitting at over 80%. So, you know, uh, the helpfulness of um, being ready for the virtual consultation through the Healthcare Homes uh, program has actually geared up a lot of general practices to be able to deal with this virtualization um, as, as a normalized um, way of delivering healthcare services. So this probably will be the norm um, where it will go to some people being face to face and a lot of people being virtual. So, you know, COVID has kind of um, changed the playing field. So uh, Health 101 now becomes COVID 201, uh, which, which effectively is virtual consultations um, are quite a key thing and integrating in, in this manner and providing uh, workforce development and cultural competencies by using technology. So um, yeah, that's, that's me. Um, I'll hand you over to Dr. Nick. So hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, and uh, what I was uh, just saying all to myself was um, it's been a pretty uh, incredible six or eight weeks uh, for me and obviously for all of you. And I just want to acknowledge um, the incredible change that has had to occur. And let's face it, it has been forced on both yourselves and your patients to some extent, uh, particularly those of you not already in a healthcare home and not using the healthcare home model of care. So I want to acknowledge those um, challenges for all of you. Um, so I'm Nick Chamberlain and I used to be a GP and at some stage I went over to the dark side. I used to be a colleague of Andrews in Whangarei, born and bred Northlander, and uh, now I'm his boss, which is um, the only reason I did it. Um, uh, we are um, uh, in Northland pretty lucky to have been involved with healthcare homes since the beginning of the journey really. And I think the DHB and, and Primary Health Organization was uh, uh, a, a very early um, starter in that. And it all stemmed from uh, a trip that a few of us went on to have a look at other systems and, um, and 
you could just see the value of this integrated model. Our, our model in Northland is called the Neighbourhood Healthcare Homes because we're trying to base it around localities or neighbourhoods as well. Um, so this last month of massive change and disruption has um, forced some uh, pretty, I think, clever approaches to implementing um, something that was going to be really challenging and probably pushed everyone forward by about 10 years. And, uh, you know, usually um, strategy is easy and implementation is the hard part. And I think in this case, there is a risk that we've had to do this so quickly around virtualizing care and um, making things safe for yourselves and patients that um, we may have left, left out a few steps. And, uh, and I really believe that some of the um, support that comes from the healthcare home model uh, is, and, and some of the things that Andrew and Lance have talked about are really, um, uh, vital to ensuring that uh, there aren't some unintended consequences along the way. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of pretty complicated slides and I don't want you to memorize them. Uh, but what it does show is that outside of um, general practice and uh, the primary care, there's been a huge amount of work, and I think you know that, not just within the health sector, but across a lot of other sectors as well. And so uh, I chair a multi-agency group, which includes iwi, all the councils and all the social sector leaders, and all of them are doing a huge amount of work. And it, it's, we've managed to split it into these categories, and I just wanted to give you a little sense of some of that. Um, so obviously health, as uh, front and centre focus and within that we've got a number of categories of, of work around Māori health, communication which has been vital, screening and testing, um, the whole of the health sector's welfare, um, hospital services and really big change within hospitals as well and you'll have seen that on TV and various other places so you'll know some of the structural change and the challenges there. Uh, workforce and then uh, primary care. So, um, but outside of that, there's a whole lot of work around community order, welfare, huge amount of work going on in welfare. For Northland, we've got a drought going on at the same time, so that's been a real challenge. And then there's the whole recovery process as well. So just wanted to highlight how much else at a big system level. But let's just move into the um, healthcare home system level and the virtual care. So I just drew up a bit of a framework for me to help think this through and I'll talk it through um, uh, in a little more detail if you don't mind. So um, I put in a number of uh, um, uh, well-known uh, um, frameworks within this and one of them is what Andrew mentioned which is the quadruple aim that looks at uh, not only population health and making sure that we're eliminating inequities but also improving uh, quality and safety and patient experience um, and making sure that there's value, value and sustainability considered and then the um, very important uh, issue of well-being and that's particularly well-being of the healthcare workforce and staff. Um, so the first two, um, population health and improving patient experience, uh, talk to a lot of the clinical and the things that need to be considered. The next one I want to talk to you about, which is value and sustainability, is actually what sits behind all of, um, all of these changes and what enables them uh, has to be a sustainable business model, otherwise it's not going to last. So I'm looking at the, these changes and thinking there probably is some pretty good stuff in here. It's probably gone a bit far. You're all told uh, one Sunday night that you needed to get to 70% virtual care and by Monday you were pretty much doing it. Um, some of you had to shut the doors for a little while to do that and uh, acknowledge that, but uh, amazingly responsive. But that's probably not the ideal and it's somewhere less than that and as um, Lance mentioned I think it's currently sitting at 80% uh, virtual care. Um, so it's reflecting on how you can sustain this at the right level, whatever the right level is and uh, and then um, uh, I wanted to talk a bit more about 
changes around potentially around well-being and the things that have had to be changed. And then I've put across the top three levels and they're, they're just pretty arbitrary. They, they come from a, um, an old piece of work which was around the system level measures called the Integrated Performance Incentive Framework and there were actually four levels. There was entry prerequisite, then an improvement level, then excellence and then breakthrough. And there were incentives with each of those. So I was just suggesting potentially there could be a, a framework around potentially financial incentives and, and payment models based on where you're at. Um, and, and in fact, So I thought I'd just move to each of the these areas, the best to me mode and what is their access, but we all know it's been quieter than it, it, uh, it probably should have been, both in hospitals and in primary care. I know it's now ramping up. What's the unmet need? Is this new model and the, and the virtualization that's occurred um, resulting in uh, health inequities and, and is, are there major issues around access? Because we haven't done probably as much as we could around re really clever communication out to our communities, getting them to understand some of the issues that they probably need to understand around uh, um, uh, a virtual model of care and um, you know, it's, it's also about all of you, uh, providers and clinicians, and uh, I know you've been forced into this. Maybe it's going well, maybe it's not. So I think there needs to be more work around that support. But um, within, a, a, within the population health and, uh, and eliminating inequities, some of the things that I think need to be thought about are around uh, reporting access and, and uh, what's going on by ethnicity. Uh, having a clear equity policy. It, it, a lot of these things are within the healthcare home components, so I won't talk too much about that. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that I kind of showed you in that big wiring diagram just before about all the interagency work is the, um, the breadth and complexity of health and social care coordination, and, and some of that needs to be considered within um, the model of care. And then obviously the opportunities around shared care. So I'll just move to the next, which is around your patient experience. And that's mainly the, uh, and sorry, Andrew, if you don't like the words, but the, you know, virtual care or, or alternative care. Um, uh, and, and some of that uh, we're all aware of. So most practice, all practices are doing some sort of telephone consultations now. Um, and I, I heard there's still many practices that aren't doing anything in the way of video conferencing. And we don't know what patients like, but I think there's probably been some work already and they probably do prefer um, a mix of both telephone consultations, but also the opportunity to be able to see someone at the end of a screen. Um, so that's something to consider and I think it is an important part of virtual care. Um, it's vital that uh, Practices are able to shift to a model which allows for electronic billing. Um, and uh, um, we talked about the needs for some sort of uh, electronic health records and shared electronic summary records. I believe all of that is going to become more um, critical uh, in, this, in this new virtual world. And of course, we don't even know how long this is going to go on for. But in some way or another, it's going to go on for some time. I mean, I, I think when we're back to level two, there'll still be, um, you know, advice to try and avoid um, as much travel as possible and and avoid um, too much in the way of face contact, face to face contact. And so I think there will, for for a long time, be uh, drivers for a change in this model of care. Um, so so. Just moving through that, I guess uh, what I'm suggesting within this continuum is that uh, some of the healthcare home uh, components 
could be in a, in a mid place of excellence, but I think to really achieve that breakthrough or really high performance, you've got to have most of those components of care because um, uh, considering equity and some of the other areas has to be just core to what you're doing. But there's a whole lot of other components which um, I think enhance both uh, the clinician's experience uh, and also patients. So this is probably the one I wanted to talk a bit more about and I don't have the solutions but it, it occurs to me that at the moment um, and I don't want to go into um, you know, the last few days for all of you which has been pretty darn disappointing I've got to say uh, but um, and uh, issues around uh, promises or broken promises but um, what I do want to talk about is um, uh, the fact that um, uh, the fee-for-service model, as it currently sits, probably isn't fit for purpose in, if in, a, in a different environment like we're in at the moment. And it also shows how vulnerable um, practices can be to change. Okay, this is the biggest change in healthcare in 100 years or 102 years, but uh, even so, um, I think this does show some of that vulnerability around the fee-for-service model. Um, there is the option and, and a number of uh, places around the country do fund a model of care such as a healthcare home model of care. Uh, in Northland we put in two or three million dollars a year to support the healthcare home model of care and so that's an enhanced um, uh, payment to um, support uh, the fact that you are probably with this model of care, going to be having less bums on seats. It's, it's to encourage that and to take more of a population health approach. But, and I've said it for years, but I think it's even more uh, appropriate now. Probably the safest and most appropriate model of care would be a salaried practice model. And that would be you know, based around the, uh, um, the senior medical officer Mecca. And uh, uh, with that, I think um, you have the opportunity to really take a population health approach to care and, and look at your whole population and also um, uh, ensure you don't um, uh, get into that fee-for-service bums on seats approach. So I'll just move through to the last. Um, all of these frameworks have well-being as, as a, a critical part and let's face it, well-being has driven this. It's been patient well-being and your own safety and well-being has driven these changes. Uh, and quite a lot of things have happened there and I think you're aware of all of them. But some of the critical things is ensuring you've got adequate PPE, that you've got a model and a stream for your respiratory patients and or um, they all go to a testing centre or somewhere else where you don't have to uh, care for them and therefore can continue to care for all the non-COVID patients. Because let's face it, they are are the majority of our patients and thankfully thankfully because uh, uh, of the effectiveness of some of these public health measures in the lockdown um, and I guess really just moving through um, getting the support of some something like the collaborative I think makes a huge difference to well-being as well um, and having that collaborative approach and it is very supportive um, I think is, is critical for that um, and it does encourage teamwork um, and some of the other initiatives that sit in there as well, such as health improvement practitioners and health coaches with the new mental health, primary mental health funding, should help and fit very nicely into that team-based healthcare home model of care. Um, and there, at some stage, uh, there's also the uh, benefits of working in a network uh, or a neighbourhood and having support from your colleagues and working together in that way. Um, my final slide is just to say this big beast is still sitting in the background. Uh, I assure you I haven't seen it uh, and uh, the minister hasn't received it yet uh, and possibly will soon. Um, so I don't know what's going to be in there, but I do think there are some, going to be some opportunities for primary health care. Uh, clearly it was written before COVID, so... Uh, that will need to be taken into account, but I think there is a big uh, focus on primary health care in that uh, review, and it's going to be interesting times. So um, thanks very much. I'll uh, end there and stop sharing. Fantastic. Um...
So I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's worked. Hey, look, thanks so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lance, and thank you, Nick, for uh, your insights and uh, your sharing. I mean, we're certainly hearing that the model is one that is encompassing um, Kopapa Māori and uh, working very well with our communities. And we're also hearing that the system doesn't support them, that what's emerging from this COVID opportunity. But it appears that the healthcare home attributes seem to make general practice more resilient. And that's certainly something that, that we need during this crisis. Okay, we'll move quickly into Q&A. So there is a Q&A function on your um, screens there. Uh, we've got a bit of a queue of questions here already, which I'm going to open up on. And if we don't get to your question, we will follow up. So if we don't get to it today, don't worry, we'll follow up on it and make sure that we cover it off. So um, question that's working from the top. I will go to the top and work my way down. Uh, how have we engaged our communities in the, for feedback, Māori and Pacific. Uh, Lance, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, I can pick that up. So we've, um, each area has their own uh, health care homes lead. And as part of each area, each lead goes out to the communities to um, bring in and, and run different um, whānau or patient voice sort of consultation processes. Um, and then uh, runs the potential model past them. And then those leads then bring it back to the national working group and we discuss those at a national group. We also have a Fano person who sits um, at a governance level and a part of a model of care who participates at every component of um, Healthcare Homes Initiative. Yeah, and I think that's answered a few questions because we've got a, a raft of questions around co-design and reaching out to Māori communities. So thank you, Lance. Um, Is, tend, is the TEND app or clinics a threat to primary care? Um, Andrew, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a, we've seen several uh, attempts, both um, I guess even nationally or worldwide, of, of people offering virtual consultations to patients that aren't in an enrolled population. My view is that... Um, uh, my own practice can do everything that TEN can do, um, probably more efficiently in a way that's more uh, holistic because I've got the person's notes in front of me, I've got other modalities that TEN won't do. So I can triage for the patient, I can video consult them, I can telephone consult them, I can brief message them on management health, they can come and see me face to face. Um, they know me, they've known me for a long time, they know the practice staff, they know my team. I don't intend to offer any of those things. It's a boutique offering for people with cash in their pocket. And I don't personally think it gives my particular practice any threat at all. Whatever team can do, if they can do it well, I'll do it better. I mean, I'll just take on the processes they've got and work out a way of, of um, uh, to, um, putting them into normal day-to-day -day work. I think everything that looks slightly like a, um, a threat to us or a, you know, disruptive innovation, Disruptive innovation generally comes to Morris business as usual, and then they tend to have to try and do something that actually is um, smarter than what we're all actually currently doing. So I don't think particularly, I'll be interested to see how they go, but I don't think they're going to be able to um, remove enough business day to day to be of any particular business concern to me. Yeah, I agree. I think there's an opportunity there to um, incorporate what TEND offers into, into mainstream general practice in any case, and I think the healthcare home has done that. So here's a question for Nick. Will there be pressure on the HBs who are not currently funding healthcare homes to start contributing? Yeah, so um, look, I've been trying to pressure for years DHBs that aren't, and, and there has been some uh, change there, uh, and we have seen some DHBs who are doing that. So we Northland aren't alone, there are a number that are. Um, but I think I think this new environment is a really good opportunity for healthcare home uh, consideration of support for healthcare homes uh, at a DHB level, certainly at a PHO level and at a practice level. Um, but there's also some uh, potential for national support there. Um, and I think that needs to be considered because there might be the healthcare home full-blown model of care, but there's also the healthcare home light, I'll call it. I don't know if actually exists, but um, certainly that's an opportunity, I think, for practices who don't want to go all the way. Um, it sounds like a lot of you are doing that to some extent, and, and it sounds like the collaborative has got uh, 
really around a lot of uh, practices and supported a lot of people um, who aren't part of the um, true or the, of the healthcare home collaborative itself. So, you know, I think there's all sorts of options. And so there could be um, various lighter options around support as well. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I mean, one of the things we're looking at in Canterbury is, is a healthcare home light, which is kind of the nine core elements. But if we can get all practices to do, we'll, as the analogy says, when the tide comes in, all boats will rise equally. And we're hoping to see that. Um, uh, a question here uh, for Andrew. When a GP is triaging, are they speaking to each other's patients and then booking with a regular GP? Uh, yep. So it depends really what the problem is. So um, there's no... It's not possible in a practice to actually answer every single one of the calls for all your patients that just either you're not rostered on or... Um, um, so what we aim to do though during triage is that if we're on triage and we see one of our own patients on the list, we will all actually ring our own patients wherever possible. Um, as a general rule, if someone had a more long-term condition problem that needed a consultation, we will tend to book that person with their normal host GP, the person they normally see for continuity. If it's something just a, a simple episodic um, thing that you could resolve in, in a visit and you've already done the triage, talk to them and you can resolve it either over the phone or you bring them in, um, you often say, uh, um, give them the offer, do you want to see your own doctor or me? Cause, and most people with something simple say, no, I've seen you, I'll come on and um, talk to you. So a bit of both. So we'll tend to try and bring our own patients wherever possible. We'll, we'll tend to put our patients for continuity that need it with long-term conditions back with their doctor and solve things that look reasonably simple by ourselves as long as the patient's keen. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, look, I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to take one last question, and it's one that I've been prodded to answer because we hadn't picked it up earlier. And this one is for Lance, and it's how do you get Māori involved in co-design, especially when we don't have technology equity? I think the question is very much around technology equity in the model. Um, so the, the key there is, is, is you're included at every level. So you're included at a community level. Uh, I'm Māori. Uh, I've been in the healthcare system, so I know how systems work. Um, you, you get the model. You, you then road test it against your local um, treaty or Māori providers. Um, they're included in the development of the co-design model. Um, and and it, it, to be honest, it's a multi-pronged approach. So um, some Māori will want a, a general practice physical visit. Some Māori will want a home visit uh, or, or um, a marae-based visit. Some Māori will want um, their consultation just as a normal consultation. Some will want to have a um, in te reo Māori uh, consultation. So the key is having a multi-pronged approach and then a sliding scale across the, the health care spectrum so that um, the right every answer is the right answer because it's been developed by the, by the communities and Māori organisations. And, and participants in the system as well. So we do a lot of surveys um, on Māori who have actually utilised the system and asking them for feedback on how we can make enhancements um, uh, on a regular basis. Got a lance, thank you. Okay, so before we move to a closing karakia, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their wisdom tonight, and also for you guys to coming in and listening and asking asking questions. We will get to those. Um, I have another slide actually. And I'm trying to go the right way. So as chairman of the collaborative, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the healthcare home leads who've worked to support our many practices in making transformational change. And a big thanks to Amajit Maxwell, our program director, and to our project coordinator, Scott Emrys. I mean, I think the leads are a good looking bunch. Um, there's no picture of me in there, which is fortunate. Um, so thanks guys, great effort, uh, it's amazing. And just a reminder that we have got our website um, and other areas just for you to go in and grab some resources. Um, you know, feel free to jump in there and uh, help yourselves. Uh, we are keen to keep the collaborative as open source as possible, but the, one of our challenges is the funding to keep the collaborative operating as well. And we are looking to get some centralised funding as part of that broader uh, funding issue to make sure that the work we're doing uh, that benefits both patients and clinicians uh, can be shared by all. I'd like to thank each panelist and see finally once again and say, are there any closing um, any closing comments that you have? I'd just like to um, big shout out to all um, all your primary care providers who've done a remarkable job under incredible uh, pressure in the last month and proven the um, worth of primary care and how such a strong platform for the whole health system and. Um, and how sad I was this week to hear that we're not actually particularly valued by 
those that um, make decisions on our behalf. But keep up the good work, and I'm um, very um, happy to have been able to speak to you guys tonight. So thank you. Thank you. So look, I'll say uh, good night. Uh, thanks to all guys. Hey, look, and stay safe in your bubbles. Keep doing what you've got to do. It looks like we're getting on top of this thing. And I'll hand over now to Lance, if you could please close our session with a karakia. Oh, good off, Arno. Um, acknowledgements to all those who have passed through COVID as well, just before I close. But um, I'll just close out with a karakia. A kia tau, kia tato katoa, te atapai o tō tato i, I karaiti, me te ihu, um, me te aroa o te atua, me te whiwhi nga taitanga, ki te wairua tapu, ake ake, amene. Kia ora.